my childhood, like so many others, was pretty complex. And I struggled deeply with the concept of religion and what it might look like for me. You see, I come from, well, a mixed marriage per se of a loving Catholic father and a very traditional Southern Baptist mother. Um, and this relationship was complicated by the fact that I had been born out of the mystical protection of holy matrimony. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's that blessed religious institution that is between one man and one woman. Uh, you can imagine the difficulty for this couple attempting to marry in the state of Texas in 1973. You would think that it would be the child born out of wedlock. While in truth, this was a big issue. It was in fact the local Catholic priests who wouldn't marry them due to the fact that my mother insisted that the Pope was the Antichrist and refused conversion into the Catholic faith. So off they went to the Baptist minister in town who also would not marry them, uh, largely because my father refused to give up alcohol and dancing, prerequisites for entry into the Baptist faith. Um, but not really. It was actually because, yes, our Baptist minister also felt that the Pope was the Antichrist. This meant that my parents married in front of the justice of the peace and my religious upbringing had begun with a bang. This mixed marriage, which I'm happy to report is 46 years strong still, meant that I spent my early childhood entrenched in the passion, ritual, and often somber Catholic faith with candles and crucifixes and Eucharist. I'm often horrified at remembering the Catholic communion as I now realize it to be a practice of really cannibalism. Apparently you shouldn't eat people unless they've crashed into an icy mountain or they are your Lord and savior. For unknown reasons, I made the decision at an early age to convert from Catholicism to Protestantism. While I can't remember why, I do remember the day that I had to tell my father that I was converting. My father really wasn't, nor currently is, a strikingly religious man per se. But he had been involved in the uh, male community organization of the Catholic faith called the Knights of Columbus for many years and many a spaghetti dinner as well as a dedicated supporter of our Catholic Church in the very small, mostly Protestant town in Texas where I was raised. So you can imagine that this announcement of his only son converting to a heretic's religion did not go over well. In hindsight, I like to think of it as my way of preparing him for the series of future disappointing conversations to come. Conversations like, Sorry, you wanted grandchildren, Dad, but two biological men simply can't reproduce yet. Or, I have joined a Unitarian Universalist church. Or most recently, I have decided to quit my lucrative job and pursue the field of ministry. To this day, I am not sure which of those announcements has had the most shock value in my family. Unlike my father, my mother was thrilled. This conversion meant her child would be baptized in the proper full body dunking method that clearly is the only way to get all the sin out as opposed to this silly sprinkling business, as she said. In the Baptist faith, this demonstration, baptism, is a visible commitment to the church and the assumption of many new ideas that I upheld at the time with complete conviction. Beliefs like women have no place in the pulpit and for that matter should remember their place in society as well. 
dancing and drinking were definitely sins and thus they must be done very quietly without the knowledge of my grandmother, often in the dark of night, since everyone knows that God can't see you when the lights are off. My homosexuality was definitely an abomination. And finally, probably most importantly, Jesus Christ could save my mortal soul. The word Christ originates from the Greek word Christos and literally means covered in oil or anointed. This is a translation from the Hebrew Mashiach, thus referring to Jesus as Christ is in fact acknowledging his anointment as the savior prophesied in the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. This belief that Jesus is my savior manifested many confusing behaviors in me. There is a tremendous power in being told that some figure born thousands of years ago who excruciatingly died for your sins could cure your sinful nature. This is a thought that scared me to the core. I was taught that my actions of homosexuality were sinful, but somehow would be forgiven just as long as I lived in denial of my flesh for the rest of my life. The old adage, love the sinner and hate the sin, was pretty common in my childhood development. I internalized this message, the message that somehow I wasn't good enough for God, at least as my full complete self, and this hurt my heart. It resulted in a multitude of silent prayers, endless nights of crying, shouts to ang of anger to God, and a deep internal rage at my very own nature. I spent much of my pre-adolescent years trying to pray the gay away. Now in the Baptist faith, we have a very common practice of inviting people up to the altar near the end of every single service to accept the Lord Jesus Christ into their hearts and be saved forever. I must have dedicated my life to Christ 10 times over, each time not feeling any closer to the divine and certainly not any straighter. Was this my Jesus? a judgmental yet forgiving representation of God on earth? New, New Zealand theologian Lloyd Gearing in a 1998 article found in fourth, the fourth R journal entitled, How Did Jesus Become God and Why? provides a remarkable and succinct history of the ascension of Jesus to Christ. He purports that the New Testament book of Acts attributed to the disciple Peter indicates that this is the resurrection that classifies Jesus as Christ. Somehow between the death on the cross and the act of God performing the resurrection, Jesus is mystically elevated to Christhood. Seemingly contrary to this is in the book of Mark, also in the Newer Testament, Jesus, where Jesus is referred to, again, by Peter as the Christ, while Jesus is still alive, in direct, comp in direct opposition to the previous work of Acts. To further compli complicate this contrary nature of the Christian Gospels in general, the same book of Mark provides fodder to the belief that it was upon Jesus' baptism, this is my mother's favorite biblical character, John the Baptist, who, who performs the anointing, that Jesus was indeed God on earth. As the dove descends upon him and we hear God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. As if this conflicting information wasn't enough, the writers of the book of Matthew and Luke use biblical lineage to indicate the anointing of Jesus. Matthew tracing Jesus back through the lineage all the way back to Adam. Adam and Luke traced all, in Luke traces Jesus all the way through the famous bloodline of Abraham. And both writers emphasize the anointing of Jesus as a birthright. Finally, there's the Gospel of John, 
And this is perhaps where the real controversy lies. All in a scripture verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Here we see the implication that Jesus represents as Jesus represented as the Word, and that in fact he was part and parcel of the Godhead from the very beginning of time. There are various origins of the Christ story, clearly. And some of these were debated during the original organization of the Christian church. In 325, then Roman Emperor Constantine the Great convened a mass meeting of all the Christian bishops. And it was at this meeting, the Nicene Council meeting, that two major factions were asked to reconcile in what is referred to as the Arian controversy. The first group was entrenched in the teachings of John specifically that Jesus and God were one in the same since the beginning of time. Essentially, they were arguing that Jesus was divine from origin and was begotten of God, not made. This faction was led by a man named, a bishop named Alexander. Counter to this argument was the then heretical idea that Jesus was not in fact Christ, origin or from origin of time, but was somehow lower than God. This belief damaged the idea of the Trinity, a thought Alexander and his followers really could not reconcile. This group, the ones that believed in the Unitarian idea of God, was led by the Bishop of Alexandria of Egypt, Arius, thus the name of the controversy. I think it's really cool to know that Arius is in fact one of our Unitarian ancestors from a group of heretics within the Catholic faith. The result of this council meeting was the historical decision that Jesus was in fact divine from origin of time and that the Trinity was fact. Now I haven't checked the chat prompt but at this point, you've either tuned me out, turned on some music, left our virtual sanctuary, you may have fallen asleep, and really, well, I can't say I blame you. While theologians may marvel at this dogmatic rhetoric, most of us hardly care. I'm sharing this information with you today to demonstrate part of my healing process. These conflicting and odd accounts of who, what, when, and why Jesus is or isn't Christ are really not relevant to my understanding of this man today. I view Jesus as much more than this argument. To demonstrate this, I need to journey back to my college years. As a result of what I now to believe some kind of divine intervention, I joined my campus's non-denominational, largely African-American church, where I sang for four years in a gospel ensemble. It was in the midst of a culture so foreign to my own that I recognized a more powerful and personal Jesus. One whose message of healing, acceptance, promises for the meek and the weak were accepted with open hearts and arms weekly as our choir toured the state of New York. We would often bring musics to rural or inner city churches full of individuals marginalized and struggling, but for one to two hours a night, the collective consciousness and holistic healing hands of Jesus, specifically Black Jesus, were felt by all who were present. This is the power of Jesus's message. We are the church. These walls, virtual or physical in nature, are not us. It wasn't until my early adult years that I completely left religion and 12 years ago stumbled into my now home church in Walnut Creek, California, Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church. As a new Unitarian Universalist minister, I no longer look for salvation in any kind of external source, be it Buddha, Mohammed, or yes, even my childhood Jesus. And, and I would be lying if I didn't admit that I have a secret. A secret that I believe many of us may share. 
And that is that I still believe in Jesus. I've spent the past 12 years witnessing the power of our UU principles in action and our amazing collective spirit and community. I strongly feel these values align themselves with the entire life and death of this character, Jesus. With this said, I must admit that I feel as though Jesus is a bit of a dirty word in the umbrella of the Unitarian Universalist faith. In some respects, he should be. The Jesus of my childhood has no business in our UU faith and homes. However, I would submit to you today that this is not in fact the real Jesus and that Jesus has been stolen by the more conservative religious right in our society. There's an internal struggling happening right within the Christian faith as we speak. There are more progressive Christians now who believe the religious right is damaging the faith's reputation as a whole. In Dan Wakefield's book, The Hijacking of Jesus, How the Religious Right Distorts Christianity and Promotes Violence and Hate, he expresses this frustration. He himself is a longtime United Church of Christ member. He says, when I say I am a Christian, I feel the need to explain myself. In his book, Mr. Wakefield traces the history of the rise of the religious right to the civil rights movement of, 19, of the 1950s and 60s. He purports that the right-wing political parties did not recognize the power of linking religion to the political process until a religious backlash was felt beginning in 1968. This was shortly after the civil rights movement and many church congregants had become frustrated and disillusioned by their church's stance for civil rights. These more socially conservative groups left the church or withheld fiscal contributions. Eerie how life today in Unitarian Universalism may mirror some of these feelings. Many years would pass while the former church members gained prestige and formalized their organizations outside of the churches that they once had been members of. And this brings us to 1981, where we see the creation of the Council for National Policy. This is a little known group. It has a few hundred of the most powerful conservatives in the country as members. And some of the members included Tim Leahy, the author of the Left Behind book series. It's a fictional book um, accounting for the second coming of Christ. You can Google second coming of Christ if you don't know what that is. Um, or D. James Kennedy, who is a uh, well-known mega church pastor and TV evangelist. But this was the beginning of a complex interweaving that was intentional of religion and politics. Of this marriage, Jim Wallace, a popular journalist and editor of the Sojourners magazine has said, I think the religious right is the political seduction of religion. There were political operatives on the far right who had meetings with a handful of TV preachers and they made a deal. You give us your church members list, said the far right political pundits, and we will make you into household names. By linking those names to our databases, you will become famous and you will gain political power. This agreement between frustrated and impassioned religious leaders and desperate social conservatives yielded a marriage of convenience and horrific fruitfulness. This partnership was demonstrated by the failed presidential run of Pat Robertson in 1988. And while this was mistakenly seen by the liberal media as a failure for the religious right, it was in fact the catalyst that created the powerful Christian coalition. This is a group that attempts even to this day to advocate and influence political matters when it comes to family values, anti-Christian bigotry, training of religious leaders in evangelical ways and fundamentalist thinking, and speaking out in public forums on religious and socially conservative topics. 
These organizations and others continue to represent Jesus as a threat of fiery brimstone and, and eternal hellfire, much like the Jesus of my youth. I'm not suggesting we bring this Jesus into our UU fold. I find myself aligned more with yet another one of our UU ancestors, Thomas Jefferson. A story is told that while he was in the White House, he began a project of cutting his Bible apart and pasting pieces back into a notebook, but only those that he felt made sense to him. In this way, he hoped to discover the real Jesus all those many years ago. He specifically wrote about this exercise in his journals. He says, among the sayings and discourses imputed to him, Jesus, by his biographers, I find many passages of fine imagination, correct morality, and the most lovingly benevolence. And others, again, of so much ignorance, so much absurdity, so much untruth, charlatanism, and imposter, as to pronounce it impossible that such contradictions should have proceeded from the same being. I separate, therefore, the gold from the dross, restoring him to the former and leaving the latter to the stupidity of some and the roguery of others of his disciples. I wish that for our faith movement. I wish that we may realize that Jesus himself may have been, if real, a Jewish rabbi and a massive reformer of that faith. I think that embodies our values. I believe that this is the gold of which Jefferson is speaking. Jesus is more than just the savior of my childhood. He can be used to invoke the principles of Unitarian Universalism in direct combat of his corruption by the religious right. In this aspect, I challenge each of us to familiarize ourselves with the life and times of this greatly celebrated religious radical. And while I doubt that many, if not all of us here, would ever dare to call ourselves Christian, we may be content with the description used by UU Minister Victoria Weinstein, who refers to herself as a UU on the Jesus path. In her sermon, Jesus was a humanist. If this is still not palatable to you, then perhaps we can again turn to our UU ancestor, Thomas Jefferson, who when asked if he was a Christian, responded, to the corruptions of Christianity, I am indeed opposed, but not to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. I am a Christian in the only sense in which Jesus wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to Jesus's doctrines in preference to all others, ascribing himself every human excellence and believing he never claimed any other. I am asking each of us to invoke the UU principle of the individual search for truth and meaning responsibly and remind us all that the reforming Jewish faith of Jesus is in fact one of our faith traditions and deserves a certain amount of understanding and respect. In an article published in the UU World in 2004 entitled Jesus and the Modern Seeker, the author, Eric Walker Winstrom, notes, in fact, one might say, this is the heart of the Christian promise, that this man who lived first in first century Palestine and in some mysterious way lives on, still welcomes all who respond to his call to follow, still points to a vision of God's rule made real, and still offers healing to those who have need. Creeds and catechisms aside, this is the heart of Christian teaching. This is the permanent. All else is transient. In closing, I would just like to share one last simple story that I think demonstrates my relationship to the label Christian. 
It's told that a fundamentalist Christian asserted to a Unitarian Universalist, I hear you deny the divinity of Christ. That's untrue, said the Unitarian Universalist. We don't deny the divinity of anyone. May we all be that kind of Unitarian Universalist, or dare I say, that kind of Christian. Thank you.